Okay, great. Uh, we are actually going to get started today. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we hope that this um, was a great way for all of you to get out and uh, kind of get out of your day to day, even though we can't get out of our houses during this kind of crazy time. But we're really excited about a great virtual event today. Um, we want to welcome our, uh, our sponsors and our panelists. Um, we want to specifically thank C3 advisors uh, today. Um, we definitely uh, really respect and value their opinion, not only as a leader in the industry in terms of SD-WAN technologies, but also as a U.S. signal partner. My name is Amanda Regnier. I'm EVP of Products and Services, and I will do my best at moderating today. Um, we do have a cracked beer here in the U.S. signal office. Say it isn't so. And, um, and uh, we really hope to have a good, a good, a good uh, turnout today and a good presentation. Matthew Tolk, President from C3 Advisors, and Joe, an SD WAN engineer at C3, will be um, our featured presenters today. Our panelists will be um, Pepe Garcia, Director of Product Management at Palo Alto, specifically related in working on the SD WAN um, product uh, solution for them. Patrick Miller, Product Manager at US Signal, and Barrett Lemonet. Research and Development Engineer at U.S. Signal. Um, we just want to have a few housekeeping items today uh, before we get started. First of all, I'd really like to thank all of you for your questions that you um, that you submitted via the online registration. It was great. We had, I think, 12 pre-submitted questions. They were really good and gave our panelists a great opportunity and time to really think about their answers. Um, we are going to take as many questions as possible. Uh, we recommend and really um, request that you use the Q&A aspect of um, the Zoom technology versus the chat feature. It's easier to monitor that way. So if you do have questions during the presentation, go ahead and um, enter those in the Q&A section, and we will do our best to get to them. If we do not get to them today, we'll be sure to follow up one-on-one -on -one afterwards, just barring uh, time and how much um, we actually can get to. We want to take um, advantage to answer those questions that were pre-submitted or that were pre-submitted um, to us first. Uh, we also want to thank our sponsors because at the end of our presentation today, I think we have some pretty great uh, giveaways, and we have uh, done a random drawing. Um, actually, it's being done right now by an automated drawing uh, selector. So I had no hand in any of this. So if you didn't get something you wanted, I'm sorry. Don't shoot me. Um, but we will uh, announce those at the end of um, the end of our uh, virtual event today. So, um, yeah, without further ado, Joe, um, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Amanda, and, and thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. Um, looking forward to getting through this and, and cracking my beer and joining everybody as well. I wish we could be on site, but uh, this is the next best thing. So we'll hop right into it. Um, you know, what is SD-WAN? Um, you know, the, the, the market, the WAN market has taken a huge shift over the last you know, five years. Uh, organizations are moving to SD-WAN in masses. Uh, and uh, we wanted to show you a few characterizations of, of what SD-WAN is. Uh, for me, it's, it's a truly agnostic. You know, if your business wants to be on MPLS um, or you have a contract that requires you to stay on MPLS, you can still make that move to SD-WAN um, simply by making it one of your underlays um, and, and move and combine that with a cheap broadband circuit that you might already have. Uh, gives you the ability to have that application and circuit awareness, uh, the circuit load balancing, and then most importantly, maybe the orchestration. Um, you know, where you have that single pane of glass that allows you to assign policy, perform upgrades, and gain visibility into what's actually running on your network. You know, there's, for us, I think there's a lot of nice-to-haves. Um, you know, for, for more and more of uh, the enterprises out there, they're, they're consuming data outside of their four walls. And while it's not a requirement that you allow your employees to egress to the internet locally, um, you can do this by choosing an SD-WAN solution that has a, a built-in next-gen firewall for that, that web filtering, or you could pair it with a, a cloud-based firewall like Zscaler um, to give your employees a better experience. Uh, the second bullet point, forward error correction, FEC, and packet duplication, those, those are two that really hit home for me. Uh, when you when you look at the traditional WAN versus what SD WAN can give you, forward error correction is is a 
is a big win. You know, so Fort Air Correction will allow you to send a parity packet or a loss recovery packet for every X amount of packets that are sent. And when you do see packet loss, they have the ability to rebuild that packet without a retransmission. Uh, packet duplication is exactly like what it sounds like. Uh, you know, certain SD-WAN vendors out there will send an identical packet across two circuits and whatever one gets the other side wins and the other one gets discarded. That does mean you're using twice as much bandwidth. So there is a cost to that and that's why you have the ability to really uh, determine what traffic you want to have that, that protection on. Uh, TCP acceleration, you know, this is simply just taking that 64K buffer, that TCP window and optimizing the use of that. Um, you know, if you're not using that entire buffer, there's wasted space and SD-WAN vendors have, have made it possible to, to really take advantage of that full window uh, for, for optimization. Uh, next gen firewall, obviously it is what it is. There's quite a few vendors that have that built in and that does give you the ability to have that security in one box. Um, WAN optimization, global backbone, those two can go hand in hand and really we find those are more important when you're a global company. Um, you know, if you've got an office in China and one in Michigan, that, that WAN optimization really can help you with that deduplication. Um, and on the, on the flip side, that global backbone, we've got a lot of providers that we'll talk about today that, that have that low latency, high, highly efficient network that you provide that last mile internet circuit to get on their network and then you ride that across the globe. Uh, the gateways to public clouds and SaaS providers, you know, oh, most SD-WAN products can be virtualized and whether it's AWS, Azure or 365 or, or a UCAS vendor that you're looking at, you can extend your network out to where they sit. So uh, you, could, you can do that with a virtual appliance or again, using one of the vendors that have a POP-based and uh, POP-based SD-WAN solution where they have their infrastructure sitting in the same uh, co-location uh, center that these providers have. So I'll jump in on this uh, on this next slide. So uh, before I dive into this one, the key thing I want to tell everybody in that what, what we see is that there's typically some kind of an impending event or there's some some immediacy. And I'm going to give you an example of a few of these. There is a router refresh coming. Uh, there is a wider network contract coming due. There's a new location coming on board or there's a major application that's moving to the cloud. Most often it's one of these things that springs up that really uh, brings us to the forefront. So with that said, here are the major reasons why I, I see and my organization sees uh, organizations going to SD-WAN. Uh, using all bandwidth that's available. You know, you, everyone used to have this network of here's your primary circuit, here's your secondary circuit. And you might be able to blow the dust off of that secondary circuit because it's really only used when the primary goes down. In this day and age, this, these are active, active, unless this is a 4G connection. So you're really using both of those uh, available bandwidths uh, all the time. So if you have a 150 meg broadband connection, great, let's, let's, let's make that a part of the mix. Uh, it's, it's, it's quicker to turn up offices. If, if anyone's ever sat around and waited for an MPLS install, especially overseas, those can be six, seven, eight months. Um, with SD-WAN, grab an internet connection and let that SD-WAN uh, device make that, that tunnel connection to the rest of your network and get that location up quicker. Uh, automate, automation and orchestration of app routing. So, you know, you may say, you know, the old school way of thinking is, hey, I'm going to send my, wi my guest Wi-Fi traffic over here, but I'm going to put all my other traffic over here. In this new day and age, you're just essentially saying application number one is ERP, two or vo one is voice, two is ERP, three is video, and you're just putting all of these in order. And SD-WAN is really making those decisions on a moment by moment basis where to send that traffic. It's automatically making those decisions. Uh, more movement to uh, cloud applications, simplicity of management. There's no CLI interfaces. Most of what we're looking at are GUI interfaces and it's much more simple to manage. Network and application visibility would be the next one. So you're able to really see the, the performance of applications end to end. And you can say, hey, I saw a phone call that seemed kind of iffy at 
at 432 today from this one endpoint, there's a lot of granularity that you're provided with most of these SD-WAN offerings. Uh, measuring circuit performance. Hey, we've all been promised, you know, a 50 meg, 100 meg, 500 meg from this provider. Are they really delivering on it? Uh, most SD-WAN providers will tell you the latency, jitter, packet loss of all of your different connections and the historical uptime. So that really helps when you're looking at circuits and deciding who you should renew with and maybe who you should replace on that next contract. Um, eliminating complex routers, again, going back to the fact that you don't need this, um, you know, this CLI-based router um, and, and all the complexity in it. Because you can get rid of these complex routers, oftentimes you don't need those really expensive VARs to program those devices. Everything, again, is, is, is that GUI interface, and maybe you don't need that VAR engineer that's going to cost you $200, $250 an hour uh, to uh, to program and manage uh, that your SD WAN uh, QoS control. So instead of um, having to coordinate this with the carrier, you get to do all this yourself. Joe, I know you have some strong feelings on this one, so I wanted you to jump in on that one for a sec. Yeah, and it really just comes down to simplicity, right? I mean, everyone wants that easy button, and, and anybody that's been a network engineer long enough knows that they have to remember the DSCP codes or cost values. And if you're like me, you get to Google them every time, but that, that goes away. Uh, you really just, they're now looking at applications. Most vendors have predefined applications built in, so where you're just picking voice or you're picking SAP traffic, and you're prioritizing it that way. So the simplicity is really there and, and, and you're doing it much more at the layer seven uh, application layer. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, appreciate it. Um, next one's flexibility because you're able to use, again, any bandwidth that you can put in there. There are some SD-WAN uh, providers we've seen that can take up to eight connections. So you're really able to, uh, it really gives you flexibility as far as whatever you wanna plug into these devices. The last one is uptime. Because you're in an active, active network, if, if one of these connections goes away, your whole network isn't going down and then rebooting on another connection. Um, so um, uh, we see uptime as, as a major win for SD-WAN. So obviously we, we have to talk about cost. Um, that's probably going to be a, a key driver when you're looking at SD-WAN. Um, and you should be able to be cost neutral or save money by moving to SD-WAN, um, or at least avoid that large capital expenditure. Um, with the flexibility of an OPEX model, you're, you're giving your uh, business to the leverage of, of being able to forecast what your network is going to cost on a monthly basis. Um, more importantly, too, it can protect your business from downturn, right? And unfortunately, that happens. Um, and if you own that expensive router, it's going to be sitting on a shelf, as well as the licensing that goes along with it. Um, you know, subplanning MPLS, that's probably going to be where your cost saving is. But we understand that there are, you know, there are needs for businesses that, that want to keep that. Uh, security cost increase. I mean, there could be, right? You know, you might need that that edge-based firewall for some of these guys that don't have that next-gen firewall, or or maybe you want to go with a cloud a cloud-based firewall like Zscaler. So, yes, there could be some increased cost or a shift in in your costs. Uh, lastly, is soft costs. That's that's you. That's me. You know, so the the time that it takes to to patch the infrastructure to maintain it there's absolutely a cost that your business should be looking at with that and, and being able to to manage your infrastructure from a single uh orchestrator a single portal there's cost savings you know companies are not making money by having their engineers patch routers they make money by having their engineers design what what the next best thing is you know that's a year away or two years away that's going to improve efficiencies and, and save the company money some downfalls of course, there's going to be some downfalls. Uh, you know, it's you, you get the options, right, to manage, co-manage, or, or do it yourself. And and manage really is just being locked out of your network. And that might be fine for somebody that's um, maybe got a limited IT staff, or there's very few changes that are going on the network. Uh, and on the flip side, there's DIY. You know, get the get the hardware yourself, put it in yourself, manage it yourself. And, and you know, there there's places for that as well. 
but typically co-managed solutions are charged by site or by appliance. And this allows you to take a vacation or be unavailable for a time or spend your time focusing on, on something else on your network. Something I really wanted to jump in on is this is something that me and Joe talk about pretty often. And that is, I think every network engineer has had a managed service of some sort and has been locked out of their router, even though they just need, need to make a really simple change. And sometimes you have to wait two, three, four days for that provider or carrier to, to make that update. And you're just like, gosh, I'm right here. I just want to make this, this, uh, this change really quick. So we personally like that co-managed model a lot so that you can make those quick changes but if it's Christmas and you don't feel like doing a major change and something needs to be done on the fly, that can be taken care of as well. Really dislike solutions where you're completely locked out of, of, out of a router, especially in an environment that's, that can be intuitive and is GUI based. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that kind of goes into uh, to the next one, and that's the learning curve. Um, you know, I implemented an SD-WAN solution. We'll talk about that later, but there is a learning curve. You know, most of us cut our teeth on the command line and spent years doing it, and now we're probably considered old school. But, you know, you are going to go from that running back to walking or maybe even crawling, and you'll need somebody to hold your hand for a while to, to, to the point to where you really fully understand the, infra the infrastructure that you've, you've now implemented. Um, and, and really key to that is, is the, the vendor discovery process and the, and the migration strategy. So you really want to find a vendor that you feel comfortable with. That, and, and when I mean comfortable, I mean that they're going to be there holding your hand, going back to that learning curve. They, they, they put that trust in you that they, they will do that vendor discovery and, and create that migration strategy. You know, I always tell our customers that second only to picking the right platform is picking the right vendor. Um, that vendor is going to be there to support you, and um, it, it's it's really it's key for a successful uh, implementation. So this is you know your typical backhaul internet network. We've all done this. You know, you've got your active network. It might be MPLS. It might be internet uh, router on its own up here. And then you've got your backup network, another router, maybe a coax connection that's sitting there idle. But this is the network influence, this box here. You've got your connections to your branch offices. If those go down, you wait for that IPSLA to kick in, 45 seconds, 60 seconds, and then your maybe your DMVPN connection in the back on the backup network kicks in. Five years ago, 10 years ago, that was a great solution, but to today's standards, it's outdated. Um, you know, when you look at the services that are down in the cloud area, those are being consumed more and more, and they're not part of your network. You know, so when you look at what SD-WAN is capable of doing, it really makes that network influence the entire thing. So now your active connections are both your active network and your backup network. Those circuits are being utilized at the same time. The, the appliances are, are intelligently tra uh, routing your traffic, and because you can extend either virtually or through a pop-based solution, you now bring that cloud closer to you. And so, like I said, that can be virtual. It could sit in a U.S. signal data center. It could be on, in a pop solution. So really, that's, this, is, this is the optimal setup here where you know, your end users are going out locally and are that much closer to what they're consuming. Matthew, maybe you can walk us through some of the vendors here. Yeah, absolutely. So we have these in three different bubbles. So at the top, we've got edge-based and on-net-based. So edge-based are those devices where you're just sticking connections of any kind into those devices, and there's no network in the middle. So it's really just you're throwing that traffic out to the providers. The on-net on the right-hand side is where there is some kind of traffic conditioning. There's some kind of a network in the middle. Almost think of it like MPLS, but they're conditioning that traffic somewhere on a, some kind of a private or semi-private network. On the bottom is next generation firewalls. So some of these guys just want to be your SD-WAN provider. That's all that they're good at. That's all they ever want to be for your organization. But there are other ones that say, we just want to be your edge device and want to combine those that feature and functionality of SD-WAN and firewalling. So uh, Joe, why don't you go ahead with your case study? Yeah, so I'm gonna, uh, this is going to be real quick, but this is the company I came from about a year and a half ago before I came over to, to C3. Uh, Centurion Medical Products is a sterile surgical kit company, so we are production, manufacturing, 
shipping, uh, headquartered out of Williamson, Michigan, 10 branch offices in the US and Mexico, 1,100 employees. Um, I was a single network engineer handling the LAN, WAN, voice. And, uh, you know, it, we got to a point where, uh, well, let me back up. The key applications that you can see there were Cisco Call Manager, SAP for ERP. We had a VDI infrastructure. And again, like I said, because we were a manufacturer, we did a lot of shipping with UPS and FedEx. So we were coming up on an MPLS uh, renewal. Just like Matthew said, there's that impeding moment where you have to make a decision to stay status quo or make a change. And for us, it was uh, our CenturyLink MPLS network was coming up and we, we wanted to move away. We wanted to see what our options were. Uh, so the objectives here, these are IT objectives. These were not business objectives. I was fortunate enough to run my network and uh, design it the way I see fit and then just get business buy-in. But obviously MPLS network, five internet circuits, and replaced with broadband circuits. Um, reduced cost, that was definitely a goal of mine, but uh, the business, again, it was, they were not concerned. Uh, simplifying the network, you know, we were running OSPF, BGP, o, uh, EIGRP, uh, multiple routers at each facility. And then unfortunately, if we uh, did have a failure, we had that time where it took for it to switch over uh, to the backup circuit. And then we didn't always fail over when MPLS came back up. So there was a lot of manual interaction there. Uh, lastly, we were looking at Zscaler. So it, it was a perfect time to look at doing the local internet breakout for em, our employees. Uh, my requirements, uh, orchestration, I wanted to be on site, not hosted in the cloud. Uh, I wanted it to be an edge-based design. It was my network. I wanted to have 100% of it managed by myself. And, and yes, looking back now, I think I would, would have gone with the co-managed solution. And then vendor engineering needed to be local. And again, that goes back to the hand-holding uh, as you learn to, to walk and run again. Uh, we ended up looking at three vendors. Uh, I didn't want to drag this out. We looked at three vendors, and that was Cisco, Silver Peak, and Riverbed. Uh, Cisco, because we were a Cisco shop, um, and at that time it was IWAN. Uh, we ended up ruling out Cisco pretty quickly. Uh, when you started to look at their IWAN solution, it was difficult to implement, it was expensive, you still had to have that support contract with a Cisco partner. Whereas uh, Silver Peak and Riverbed had that WAN op that I was looking for. Um, and it became very apparent that Riverbed at that point needed two appliances to do SD-WAN and um, WAN optimization, whereas Silver Peak only needed one. So at that point, I decided to do a POC with those guys. And um, you know, that, that was it. From the point on from there, I had the, the uh, head end done and, and one site done. We ran for about six months, got all the bugs out, and then moved on with the rest of the sites. So the results, you know, we, we, we got higher bandwidth. We, you know, most of our remote facilities were on 10 meg MPLS, and we migrated them to a 20 meg or 50 meg primary fiber circuit. And we were now taking advantage of that, that backup coax connection that we were, we were, that was sitting idle. Uh, and by doing this, we were actually able to save or, or at least recognize uh, close to $300,000 in circuit costs over the 36 month period. Um, but the ability to load balance, balance two circuits negated the need for WAN op and the visibility of the network traffic. Really, this is, this is the key item here, guys. Being able to see what traffic is on your network down to the IP, down to the protocol, you really get the visibility that you might be lacking on a traditional network. And I'll give you a couple examples. You know, our Mexico office was constantly complaining about congestion. Uh, we were looking at uh, more bandwidth. And when we were able to get them on to Silver Peak, we realized that it was the employees using Wi-Fi. Uh, it was not a, a, a business related issue. So at that point, that became a business uh, concern, not an IT concern, and it was, it was quickly rectified. Another another issue that we were able to resolve by just simply being able to see the traffic was the fact that our VDI environment was not set up correctly, to say it politely. Um, we we had people in the warehouses that were taking pictures of damaged goods, plugging in a USB stick to a, a VDI client, which all those files were being uploaded to headquarters. Whereas simply just changing the DFS target file location or folder location, we were allowed to save that store, uh, local storage. Uh, and so again, it really uncovered some things that we weren't aware of. 
lastly, guys, if you're looking to, to look at an SD-WAN project in, in the near future or down the road, give us a call. I mean, I do this 100 times a day. I love talking about it. Um, I'm very passionate about it. I run it at home in an HA environment, so uh, I do love talking about it. So thank you for your time. I'm going to crack my beer now, and Amanda, I'm going to hand it off to you. Wow. I don't uh, think we've ever had something so concisely delivered in about uh, 20 minutes. Great job, Matthew and Joe. You've done this before. We thank you for the presentation. Um, I would like to hand a question over to Pepe. If you don't remember from the introductions, he is a director of product development at Palo Alto Networks. And Palo Alto has recently launched and is working on an SD-WAN um, solution. I'll let Pepe speak about that. And then also, Pepe, if you could talk to, um, are the security features sufficient to replace my firewall at each site? So are the security features within an SD-WAN solution enough to replace the firewall at um, a customer's site? Okay. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, <clears throat> so I've, um, I've been involved in over 500 SD-WAN deployments myself. Uh, at Viptela, Cisco, and now at Palo Alto Networks. And one of the things that has come out in all those examples and those, those deployments is that there's not a one cookie cutter solution for every single deployment. We have customers that have uh, PCI compliance, segmentation compliance requirements, uh, some customers that say, you know what, at all these branches, I'm okay if I send the traffic all the way to a cloud-based uh, security solution. We have some other requirements that uh, require all the security on premise. Um, so from my perspective, what I've seen is a combination of all of those. Different uh, vendor solutions offer different capabilities. Obviously, we jumped in at Palo Alto Networks coming in from a security standpoint to be able to offer a mixed environment, an environment in which you would have a heavy, um, and I call it heavy, but it's a, a full secured, uh, local infrastructure that includes both the security piece and the SD-WAN combined in one single uh, platform, or a lightweight version, which has the ability to send all the traffic into some other um, uh, locations from a security perspective. The answer is not a one or the other. You may actually have requirements of a mixed environment depending on the size of your branches, campuses, or data centers. Okay. Great. So, Pepe, do you think that the security features that are inherent in that SD-WAN appliance, is that enough? So, again, it depends on whether you have um, uh, requirements from a, a from a, um, uh, what's the word? So, uh, like PCI compliance. If you have that level of compliance, there are certain pieces that require localized firewall. Uh, most of the vendors are starting to get a lot of that capability. In integrated depending on where they come from. So there are vendors that come directly from the security perspective or they come from the routing perspective, but most of them are getting to the point in which they're adding uh, that security uh, requirement for the most basic compl uh, compliance requirements locally. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there's been quite a few uh, questions that have come in related to SD-WAN and um, how this work from home coronavirus COVID pandemic that we are all in right now, um, how does, uh, does SD-WAN change things moving forward um, from a, secu a security and infrastructure perspective? And um, in addition to that, uh, does it help at all with this new normal of remote workers? And I will pass that over to Barrett from US Signal to, to answer there? Yeah, I think it definitely plays a part. Uh, certainly, as people have been put into this position of working home from home where you've got uh, kids and all of the other demands of, of working from home, uh, those things not only put demands on our focus, but also on our infrastructure as far as within our, our home, our internet connections, uh, you know, YouTube, Netflix, uh, gaming uh, definitely can cause an impact. Uh, one of the the aspects of the SD WAN is the the WAN op side of things. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily always the uh, the, the primary side, but it is a, a definite uh, 
uh, useful component of it. People are definitely focusing more on how that reachability is achieved and being able to provide an end-to-end -end solution that allows the company to, you know, not necessarily manage that end user's connection, but provide that visibility that Joe was talking about into what's going on in their home network to an extent, obviously not all the way in, but being able to see that and help get them the best performance possible is a benefit. Uh, being able to manage the security better, um, having these uh, single pane of glass to, to keep track of all of these added endpoints is a, is a definite plus. Hey Amanda, can I uh, add to that too? Um, it, something I was thinking about too is oftentimes, you know, you have users going home and, you know, their home network isn't nearly as good as their, you know, the, the, the network they've got at the office. So uh, I like that Ford error correction uh, feature for, for somebody that can take, it, it can essentially take a wobbly connection at home and really stabilize that because it's going to, um, you're really gonna make up for those lost packets by being able to duplicate uh, packets. And Joe, I was wondering, maybe you wanna get into a little bit how uh, packet duplication fact could help someone at home with kind of a subpar, subpar connection. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. There's, there's vendors that can do forward error correction on a single, on a single circuit, right? You don't need two circuits to, to achieve that. Again, it comes back down to that TCP acceleration and not using that full window. So if you're sending a packet and there's extra space in, in there, they can send that parity bit in that packet to reconstruct that. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, an example that, that I see all the time where, you know, if you're, you send a packet and you get one, two, three, and you're missing four, and then five and six, it comes through. But then in the next packet, you get that four that was missing from the first packet that can be reconstructed on the other end so that you're not doing that full retransmission. And I want to throw in too, that some of these vendors have uh, VPN clients, right? So now you, you can have your customers or your employees using that VPN client that gets them onto their, to your SD-WAN network uh, closely. Nice. Thank you for that. Um, I also uh, have a question here related to SIP traffic. And Joe, um, sorry, you're not getting too many SIPs on that beer there. Uh, but um, how, <laughs> if you could answer um, the question related to SIP tra traffic and compared to MPLS, how does SD-WAN handle and treat SIP traffic? Um, we would love to hear that. Yeah, so I'm going to take it uh, two different directions. One, internally, if it's SIP traffic uh, within your network, it, like we mentioned earlier, you can prioritize that by application, by protocol. Uh, so it's very easy to see that traffic and, and create a policy. Externally, you know, if you're if you're using SIP for an on-premise PBX and you've got a vendor that you're creating that that SIP trunk with, there's some cool things you can do. You know, I'm going to take for example. Um, you know, a, a vendor, an SD-WAN vendor that, that hands out an IP, right? So now you're using one of their IPs versus an IP that's assigned to one of your circuits. When you build that SIP trunk using that circuit and it hits their gateway, now that, can, that SIP traffic can go down either path. So it's not tied to one circuit anymore. It has multiple paths down. So that, that gateway is the key because it knows how to get to your, to your network and it can use either path. So it provides a little bit of IP failover for you. It's a great solution. Awesome. I, Pepe, I'm hoping that you can answer this one. It's actually a follow-up for what we were talking about related to VoIP traffic. Um, but doesn't the improvement of VoIP traffic over a connection with such high packet loss need more than one connection? Uh, sorry, say so, so that again? Doesn't the improvement of VoIP traffic over a connection with such high packet loss need more than one connection? And that's well, to anyone no, I think, who might I think want. Joe just talked about the fact that Oh, okay, so I, I think that was what Joe was talking about. Um, the, the, the traffic, if you only have one single link, then having the ability to do forward error correction 
uh, helps precisely minimize the impact of that situation. If you have two links, like here at my home, I have a, a, com, a, a sorry, I think I'm losing my connection. Um, I have a Comcast connection and I have a 4G LTE connection as well. That has the ability to actually recover uh, between the two and be able to use both as Joe was explaining. So I think it's related to what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Awesome, wonderful. And while we're on um, you, Pepe, uh, there was a question asked, because there's no standard protocol for SB-WAN that the vendors have to adhere to, how does a business even really know what they want? <laughs> That's a very <laughs> good question. I get that question all the time. <laughs> And one thing that I, I'm personally, because I've worked on standards bodies for a long time, once you have a standard, it's already too late. You're not really solving the problem. The problem has already been solved a long time ago. So the reason why you don't see standards in SD1 is because everybody's trying to really address the current problems that everybody's having. So what that means is, what, what do I see most customers having problems with? First of all, they need to know what applications are running in their network, which ones are business critical, which ones are not, and then be able to optimize the performance for the business critical applications over the non-business critical applications. That's one of the reasons why when I, uh, when I came to Palo Alto Networks, I came here because we do app ID identification, deep application identification not just layer four, but we go deep into the application. An example that everybody deals with, Office 365, is not just one application, is multiple applications in the family. How do you identify all of them and provide the right priority according to the different applications that you have? That is something that because of the cloud applications being developed so quickly, changes constantly, and by the time you try to do a standard, you're not gonna get there. So you have to have the ability to identify those applications, prioritize them, and utilize the available bandwidth depending on the, the requirements of those applications. So I hope that gives you a better idea. I think that's great. Pepe, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, from a licensing perspective, uh, Patrick uh, from US Signal, could you explain a little bit about how licensing works with SD-WAN? That's a common question that we see quite a bit, correct? Uh, yeah, and it, it really comes down to the specific vendor you're choosing to work with and it, the size of your deployment, whether you're an enterprise or a, a small business office with multiple branch locations, most of them will rely on a like bandwidth level um, licensing as far as it, it tears out based on how big the connection is. Um, if you're running the orchestration yourself, there's probably going to be a licensing charge for the orchestration node nodes. Um, so that controller that oversees all that would be a licensing component for that, as well as um, the bandwidth most likely um, for the individual endpoints. And that that varies per so you want to make sure you source out. Sometimes they'll include the orchestration licensing within the bandwidth. Um, there's also a lot of times uh, licensing that will layer on top for additional security services. Um, as opposed to just a plain SD-WAN, sometimes you can push those security elements out to the very edge of the network within that uh, SD-WAN appliance, which is generally a, a white-labeled uh, commodity piece of hardware, um, which gets you away from the, uh, you know, paying for the proprietary hardware for someone like, like Cisco routers, for example. So. Great, thank you. Um, Barrett, I'm going to throw one over to you, which I thought was a really great question. There actually were quite a few that were very similar. Um, how is SD-WAN better than a router-based WAN, I guess you could say, a WAN with routers, um, with failover? How is it better? Can you create an SD-WAN solution yourself? Um, how does that work? Yeah, I think it kind of comes down to what you consider SD-WAN. Um, you know, SD-WAN really isn't isn't one thing. It's kind of a combination of uh, generally WAN optimization and VPN. You know, you could think of like a, a DM VPN is very similar to what a lot of SD WAN vendors do, and that you know endpoints will you know can and don't have to, but can automatically find each other, uh, can make a you know a multi point mesh by default. That that's very similar with a, a traditional VPN 
centric solution. SD WAN really can kind of combine the the WAN optimization side of things, the deeper level application discovery, the FEC, the packet duplication, uh, all of those things to provide a better overall service. Um, you know, um, if it depends also what you what you're looking for. If you're looking for a purely managed solution, uh, and you don't necessarily uh, care about those kind of things, it might not make a difference. Um, you know, it, there's there's so many different options in this marketplace from vendor to the style to how it how it's deployed. You know, there there could be a lot of benefit to having a single pane of glass with you know the white label hardware all on the edges or maybe virtual edges. Um, there's just there's going to be more velocity of change in a software solution than a hardware solution in a lot of cases. Um, so I think it, it can provide some more flexibility, but it really depends what you consider SD WAN. Amanda, can I jump in on that one for a quick second too? You can. Yep. I don't I don't see failover becomes less and less a part of your lexicon when you have SD WAN actually implemented because you're really going into an active active you're not really failing over per se because you're always using uh, all these circuits unless one is an LTE and you have a primary so I, I, I talk less and less about failover and more and more about putting two and three circuits into these sites, even if they're cheapos and you can use these in an active, active manner. You're really not talking about failover nearly as much anymore. Great, I think this is actually a good opportunity for us to ask our audience here today um, in, with some polling questions to get an idea of um, the folks that are on the call today that are currently using SD-WAN, if they have plans to, and then what are some of the most important things um, that they look for when selecting or if they were to select an SD-WAN solution. I've launched some, the poll obviously, yep, we've got some answers, you guys can see that here. They're coming in, we'll give a couple, couple seconds here. Nice. At least we know people are still alive. It's good. They're, they're, uh, they're out there. They're listening. Wonderful. <laughs> this is a trick. Okay. We've got over half of the folks responding, so I will end the poll, and then I will share the results here. Um, Joe, can you see the results? Matthew? Patrick? Looks like we have um, some folks that definitely have uh, have deployed a solution, and let's see, we've got about oh 57 percent, well 43 percent looking to deploy a solution. And then interestingly, um, on the bottom here, we've got the things that are most important to somebody when they're looking at a solution. And one of the questions, and I'll just throw it out there because cost savings is up there. Um, at about 50% of folks looking for cost savings. And um, that was actually a question that came in and I'll throw this over to Matthew. Uh, you know, is, is, is SD-WAN, does it really provide cost savings? And um, does it provide all of the things that, you know, that it says it's going to do, but obviously if it's gonna cost more money, I think we've talked a lot about some of the benefits related to application, applications and security, but what about cost savings? I, I generally see it, I wanna be careful with this. I generally see it generating cost savings on the telecom side. There's, there's no doubt about that. I think everyone, a lot of people on this call have had a 10 or 20 site network and there's one or two sites are in the middle of nowhere and they're like, oh my goodness, I'm spending like $3,000 a month for like a 10 meg or a 20 meg. When there's a community ISP that I would love to be able to incorporate into my wider network, but I can't because they're not part of my MPLS network. Well, in this day and age, you can really incorporate whatever you'd like into it. So it takes those really bad locations and eliminates you having to spend so much money there. I do think though, because typically most SD-WAN deployments, you're incorporating more internet in, you do need to have a little bit of a tighter security approach 
So this might mean, you know, not only putting a next generation firewall at each one of your sites, but even going a little bit beyond that because you're creating more holes into your network. So I would say overall though, I typically do see a little bit of a savings, uh, but I, I really want to strongly recommend that organizations go to their CFO and say, I'm going to steal from this jar, but I'm going to put more in this jar. So, uh, cause I, I really do think that that's the right approach. Great, Matthew, kind of um, a follow-up to that uh, that came in through the Q&A, but also was a question that was submitted um, in during registration as well as, um, you know, how do you handle or how do you suggest an organization deals with, you know, they're currently in contract with another provider, you know, how would that rollout look um, from, you know, that perspective and then also, you know, working with different providers, potentially you just mentioned an off-net rural, you know, location, $3,000 who knows whatever kind of uh, circuits that they've got there. Um, how would you suggest an organization goes, around, goes about uh, dealing with all of those differences from contract perspective and rolling out a brand new SDWAN solution? Yeah, yeah, uh, we're not typically an advocate of breaking contracts. It is an exceptionally rare scenario where we tell someone, hey, tell your MPLS provider to get lost. And that's typically a very expensive endeavor. What I would typically tell that customer though, is you probably want to draw a line in the sand as far as how much more money you want to continue to put into MPLS. Um, and maybe when, and, and remember as well that, you know, MPLS at the end of the day is, a, is just a transport. So most of these providers will take that and, and you can really incorporate that as a route on your SD-WAN network. What I might start doing though is new sites or sites that need more bandwidth, I'm sticking internet connect connectivity into that device and then I'm allowing that device to really make intelligent decisions and really move applications back and forth. And you know, you're at the point in time when, you know, take that 20 meg internet connection, but also, or MPLS connection, but put 150 meg, uh, you know, Comcast coax connection in there for, you know, for $200. But, I, I wouldn't necessarily tell folks to just eliminate MPLS. I would tell people take a hard look when they're when they're going from contract to contract, but I'm not necessarily telling you to just you know displace it right now. Kind of along those same lines, um, and we could potentially throw this one over to Pepe. Um, is for locations where there's existing MPLS already being used, direct fiber, et cetera. Um, can those be integrated with SD-WAN along with their local internet connection? Absolutely, and I think that is one of the biggest benefits of what we're seeing. A lot of people use MPLS for um, more guaranteed uh, availability of the service, and you're paying a premium to utilize that MPLS for that. The challenge has been that customers' bandwidth has been the demand has increased so much that people don't really want or need to upgrade their MPLS circuits. Okay. They can still maintain their MPLS circuits if they need to for the specific business characteristics that they're going after, but then they can start augmenting with cheaper broadband uh, bandwidth and utilizing both to be able to use the, the, the total aggregate bandwidth for their business communication. That's where I see customers actually saying, you know what, I have this three-year contract in MPLS. I don't want to eliminate it, but I do want to continue using it just for the most critical applications. That is what I see most people uh, utilizing it with. And that way you increase the bandwidth on, on the cheaper uh, connections. And now you can actually utilize both in parallel for the same site-to-site -site connectivity. And believe it or not, you can start actually now noticing whether you're actually getting better performance over the internet or over MPLS for a specific application. And if you're not getting it on MPLS, you can go back to your service provider and saying, you're not meeting my SLA that I'm paying a premium for. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Um, we are going to, we'll continue to ask questions. We actually have quite a few more for those that would like to hang on the line. Um, I do want to take a quick second though and announce our um, merchandise winners and the drawing winners because it is getting close to five. If anybody has a fast or a hard stop, we'll do that. Um, and let's see here. Um, we have got 
uh, Palo Alto, uh, thank you. They've actually provided that. The Yeti Roadie um, 24 Hard Cooler. The winner is Jason Harrison. John, John Harrison, sorry. Um, U.S. Signal gift cards, 100 to your local brewery. There are three of them we're giving out. Brett Ciceros, Elke Morgan, and Stephen DeReich have won those. Uh, the Zerto $50 Amazon gift cards, Doug Taylor. Panke Kumar are the winners of those. And the Palo Alto Yeti tumblers, there are one, two, three, four, five of those. Lori Sullivan, Dan Jacobuzak, Wally Nels, Dale Bray, Oleg Mann, and then our C3 gift card to, I don't remember where it's from, but someplace wonderful. Uh, and thank you for that, Jamie Barr. Um, for those folks, we'll reach out to you individually and coordinate shipping and getting those things to you. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll definitely make sure that we do that. Please stay on the line. Um, we do have quite a few more questions, but I wanted to at least get that out there. Uh, thank you again for all of those that took the time today to, um, to listen. And, okay, so the next question here that I have, and I think I will throw this one over to, um, to Joe. Uh, one of the things that, um, let me see here, where did this go? That this particular individual is de dealing with um, is that they couldn't take advantage of local ISPs, or couldn't you take advantage of local ISPs where it makes sense without having to implement an SD-WAN solution strategy? So this is just kind of a question, I guess, about the availability of, you know, utilizing um, your local ISPs and how does that differ? And do you really need to develop an, an SD-WAN solution? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, if I'm reading the question right, using a local ISP is, for me, that was the preferred method, right? You know, so having that, that one back to pat, that one vendor, um, to me, that, that caused a little bit of, of uh, delay, right? You know, if I could go to the LEC, have that circuit installed, or maybe it's already there, um, it was a quicker turnaround, a quicker turn up. Um, there are benefits to having that that one vendor where you can get that one single bill. But I think if I'm at reading the question right, it's, you know, you I, yeah, you definitely want to use a, a local vendor. There's no problem with that. And it might not be your primary circuit. Maybe it's your, your cheaper secondary circuit that you're, you know, you're throwing your Windows updates or your, your backup uh, traffic on. Uh, your you know your less important traffic. Awesome, great. Hopefully that um, answers it. Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely think that's pretty clear. Um, Pepe, there is a question here. Uh, we'll let you definitely toot your own horn here. Uh, is there any reason to pick Palo Alto, new to the SD WAN market, over Silver Peak that's more mature? The only advantage I can think of is if you already own your Palo Alto firewall. Is there anything else that this particular person is missing? No, so I think one of the misconceptions that Palo Alto has had SD-WAN capabilities, which if you think about what is SD-WAN, SD-WAN is application identification, is creating an, a secure overlay over any transport and having the ability to do policies uh, so that you can utilize, utilize different, underlay uh, different, different underlay technologies, transport technologies to be able to get from one end to the other end. Palo Alto has had that. They would never repackaged it as, a, as an SD-WAN solution. So what we've done is we've actually put it all together, provided some reporting to actually have the ability to do the SD-WAN capability. But that has existed for a long time. One of the other things that's happened is that SD-WAN from a Palo Alto perspective, we have the traditional SD-WAN, which includes the, the physical or virtual firewalls, the NGFW firewalls. But no, we also have the ability to include a SASE based solution. What is SASE is a terminology that, that Gartner came up with, Secure Access Service Edge. And basically what that allows you to do is have a simplified access device at your branch, and then have the ability to go into a cloud infrastructure, which Palo Alto offers the Prisma infrastructure. So you have the ability to mix and match 
your cloud services, security per, uh, per, uh, perspective, security at the branch, or a simplified branch connectivity and do a mix and match across all the different transports that you have, whether it's MPLS or GLT or anything else. That's the advantage coming from a security application identification perspective. Okay. So I hope that answers Great. Thank the you. question. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. That's good. Um, I do want to remind everybody that we will stick around as long as folks are able and willing to. Um, I think this conversation is really, really good. Uh, again, for those questions that, yeah, raise your beard. Um, again, for those questions that we don't get answered today, we will for sure um, reach out. Uh, we'll reach out individually and answer those um, as much as in the best that we possibly can. Um, Barrett, I, oh, good. I just got you with a mouthful of beer. Um, what will, what do you think that the impact of 5G will be um, on SD-WAN, if any? I think it'll have the same impact on SD-WAN as it would have on any other access, you know, dependent technology. Um, you know, it's certainly going to be a, a large amount of highly pervasive bandwidth. It would certainly be ideally usable for anything from, you know, SD-WAN access methods to, you know, just a, a more traditional access method. It would definitely be applicable. I don't think it's certainly, it wouldn't certainly take away any of that since it's, it's really just an access technology. Amanda, can I make a quick comment on that one too? Please, please do. Um, I think what could be kind of interesting and one of the things that we see down the road is now 5G for us isn't that, isn't that sexy until you get to what an unlimited plan. I do think in the coming years, you're going to have providers that will say, we're going to give you, you know, 200 gig, 300 gig of throughput for this amount or just unlimited. At that point, it's more than a failover. You can use this actively in your routes versus it just being on standby because no one wants to put 4G into their network today for anything other than a failover. But the key for me is once you get to an unlimited data cap, and I think that's going to happen, but I, I think we're still a little ways off. You see some of these uh, big tel wireless telco providers that are dabbling with, um, with unlimited 5G for home, and what will end up happening is that is kind of your beta, and then they'll open that up to all residences, then they'll open up to small business, then they'll open up to big business. But I think we're probably still at least 18 months out on that, at least. Great, thank you. I'll throw um, this question over to P. Mills, our product manager from US Signal, um, related to kind of data center and locality of controllers. And is there any benefit for customers that would like to place and implement an SD-WAN solution and placing a collector or their controller in a co-location data center provider's um, space? Uh, so that's gonna, uh, come down to a lot of the same benefits of any, you know, why you would put your your hardware in a co-location space versus in your own um, in your own facility. Um, it help that helps you get out of the data center business as a as a in focus on what your core objectives are as a business. You get the better reliability of the facility and the the, the business, physical security, the the adjacency to network connections, the adjacency to um, you know, private clouds that that provider may be running um, for additional services, and that the placement of the orchestrator um, there versus in the public cloud versus in your physical space comes down to I think more on who's managing it. Uh, if you really wanted to manage it yourself, um, there, you know, that, that will that will come into play. But as far as uh, thinking about the reliability of the hardware that that orchestrator is running on, I think would probably be the key driver there. <clears throat> and so making sure that that fits your business objectives. Um, if you're coming up against a, a hardware augment for your own, your own on-site hardware, um, putting it in a co-location facility or putting it in the public cloud um, or a, or even a like enterprise cloud, like a private cloud provider, you, you might be able to leverage their, um, their services for um, a much better deal than you would as far as making a large capex capex um, outlay. 
going to nice. Pep, Pep Bay, do you have anything to add to that at all? No, so I mean, again, it depends also on, on where you where you want to maintain the, 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 the traffic. Mo, uh, vendors store the information in the cloud that is dedicated to that customer, or you can store it in your own private data center. But again, storing it in your own private data, data center requires a lot more bandwidth, requires a lot more um, uh, equipment that sometimes is not very easy for enterprises to, to do that. So your partners, service providers or whoever is co-managing the solution with you could uh, host that for you, or it could be part of the uh, SD-1 solution as well. So I think Patrick nailed it on, on, on the head on this one. Yeah. Great, awesome. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Good, okay. Um, uh, Joe, this is Joe or Matthew, probably good for you. When we're talking about home-based solutions, um, are you adding hardware at each home or running something on the user's computer in order to enable, I'm assuming, remote work, et cetera? Yeah, you, you could do both. Um, you know, there are some vendors out there that have smaller appliances that are meant for Soho, you know, small office, home office users. Um, and I'd mentioned earlier, there are some vendors that have a VPN client built in. Um, you know, specifically some of these pop-based solutions where no matter where you're at, even in the world, when you connect to that VPN, you're no longer going across the internet and connecting to that VPN concentrator back at headquarters. You're connecting to the closest pop that you're, you're geographically near and then using that, that global backbone to get back to your resources. So absolutely, I mean, you can do either. Using that VPN client, you know, is gonna be a cheaper solution, but you know, we've talked about the benefits of having even a small appliance at home where you can do some of that forward error correction and fix those those uh, circuit issues. But yeah, definitely could do both. Awesome, great. Um, Pepe, there's quite a few uh, questions related to um, Palo Alto's Cloudgenics acquisition or the announcement um, as such that I do understand isn't quite final yet. But how does that impact the current Palo Alto SD-WAN um, landscape. So without getting into details, because we have to wait until everything uh, closes, um, the, the comment I made earlier about having a full uh, firewall capable SD-1 solution at a branch and a lighter version is precisely where we see the, the, the integration of both solutions. We have a solution that offers a SASE base. That's what I mentioned, uh, the SASE capability, that we will actually get a lot of benefit out of the CloudGenix infrastructure. And then we have the infrastructure that has the full secure capability also at the branch as opposed to on, on the cloud. And having the ability to mix and match, that's where I see the, uh, the, the integration uh, going. Okay. Great. That's awesome. And we definitely look forward to that for sure. Um, I guess I will let someone raise their hand and answer this one. Uh, how does SD-WAN, how do those products perform with the VDI environment? Thinking more from a remote work perspective, are there things that you would recommend avoiding? Um, I, I can jump in for a quick second. Uh, as far as VDI goes, what is interesting is VDI is a, is a really low bandwidth stream mostly. So um, I, I'll get to the remote work piece a second, but, but you can actually just take all those VDI sessions and send them twice. And it's that packet duplication. It's essentially this stream of packets is racing this stream of packets. And uh, SD-WAN is able to kind of interweave these two streams. So VDI can be fairly sensitive. So being able to just take that stream, that's only 100K typically per stream and interweave those, it really makes VDI sing. So you, it really kind of uh, avoids uh, you know, dropping sessions and uh, dropping sessions. Remote work is a little more difficult just because a lot of uh, organizations or a lot of people don't have dual internet connections at home. Uh, but Joe, from would FEC, would Ford Air Correction help someone running VDI from home? You know, it, yeah, if they have an SD-WAN appliance on site, absolutely. 
you know, it's it's going to be the same whether you're at a branch officer or, or if you're at home. You know, as long as you're you're picking an SD WAN vendor that has the capability of doing forward error correction on one circuit, it really doesn't matter where you're at. Yeah, and I'll you know I'll go back to my my case study. We were we had a VDI infrastructure, and we didn't know that there were problems with it until we we had the visibility into the network. We thought everything was fine. Like Matthew pointed out, that screen paint that you see is should be a hundred K. Um, but that wasn't the case with us, you know, not all the time anyway. So, again, having the visibility uh, really can fine-tune some of the applications or uh, uh, devices that you're running on your network already. Cool. I will um, switch gears here a little bit, uh, but I guess, Joe, this probably is for you because it sounds like or looks like that it might be pertaining to the visual that you had in your presentation. With the visual about having your data center at one end, co-managed SD-WAN with some cloud providers, and multi-tenant paths, and SD-WAN again before the remote offices, why would this be different from running maybe a site-to-site -site VPN with two circuits, running into routers at major offices, and just using a single circuit at low-risk offices? So the low risk office, you could, you know, you could do a single, do a, a single circuit, and you know there are people out there that want to do that that VPN connectivity, but the fact is you're still not going to have visibility into your network, you're not going to have that failover, you're not going to have that forward error correction, um, you know, most SD WAN vendors out there will allow you to create an IPsec tunnel to their box. So, you know, if you did have some appliances that you wanted to use that were not SD WAN based, and it was a couple people that came into a, a facility a couple times a day, you could connect them over VPN, absolutely. But you lose the benefits of that, of everything I just mentioned. You know, the forward air correction, the visibility into the network. So, it really is, you know, the difference between having an intelligent network that routes your traffic across each individual circuit as you define or as it sees fit versus just having that IPsec tunnel that traffic goes across it. And if it's down, it's down and it just eventually moves over to the other one. So, you know, I, I see it as a, as a big difference. I want to add one more thing to that too. And one thing is that mo if you've got two internet connections without SD-WAN at, at, at an office, you're always just sending your traffic, you know, maybe at an application level down one, down one circuit. You're not ever really using both of these circuits for that application or that big data transfer. So you have SD-WAN and you have a big file, you're shooting that both down both of these connections at the exact same time versus picking one or the other. Pepe, um, I will throw this one at you. What differentiates SD-WAN from basic policy-based forwarding? So it's very simple. Policy-based forwarding does not take into account the real performance of the application requirements. So it was basically what Matthew was just addressing with two links. Policy-based forwarding just says, I'm going to send the traffic on this link. If that link has performance issues for a specific application, you're not taking that into account and you're not able to reroute to the other link. With SD-WAN, then you have the ability to actually monitor that and monitor the application. And it may be that two applications are fine over link one, but a third application is not fine over uh, that link and you have the ability with SD-WAN to move that third application that is not performing well to the other link dynamically and actually utilize the other link for that traffic. Policy-based forwarding doesn't really have those capabilities. Uh, it has some very basic uh, monitoring capabilities, but not to the level of dynamic changes that occur quite rapidly uh, over the internet. Okay. Great, okay. Um, maybe a little bit less of a uh, technical question, but Matthew, this one I believe would be best suited for you um, and potentially Patrick if he has uh, any feedback, but um, what do we see in terms of uh, use cases? Is SD-WAN more prominent in small versus medium versus large, uh, you know, large enterprises? What are you guys seeing in the marketplace in terms of adoption in uh, 
in company size? Um, uh, yeah, I, I would say um, the, the more locations, uh, the, the more you are probably a candidate for this. Um, I, I would also even say that look, uh, organizations with less applications are even becoming a candidate for this, and I'll tell you why. Let's say that you have a major application that's hosted at US Signal, and, and you want to treat that application or US Signal like a node on your network, then you'll put a virtual or physical instance in, um, you know, in, your, um, you know, in your colo or, or in your data center so that you can measure application uh, performance. So we're seeing more of that. We're seeing a lot of these organizations be able to put virtual instances into Azure, into US Signal, into AWS, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I really see this across a wide swath. I don't really see this as being vertical dependent or even size dependent. As long as you've got at least two sites or you have a major application that you can stick a virtual instance out there, you're, you're a candidate for this. Nice, thank you. Um, I think we've added, or we've talked about this a little bit, but I think there is an aspect of um, an ERP system kind of in the mix with this question, but for businesses that already do not have or need complex routers, have very simple and consistent network structures, low overall bandwidth needs, but a gross ERP in the mix that struggles pushing packets over a LAN-WAN, um, who would, would SD-WAN help in those instances? And I'm assuming from a WAN optimization perspective, there are some, you know, there's some solutions that might help. Um, but what do you guys think? Yeah, there, there's nothing that SD WAN's not going to at least help on, whether it's visibility or or the routing of traffic, right? Um, if it's a hosted ERP solution, there's a good chance that maybe you can extend out to that network or get yourself closer through a pop-based solution. If it's if it's in-house and and you've got people at remote offices connecting to it, then being able to condition that line those circuits with the SD WAN appliance is is absolutely going to help. And I'll tell you a story. You know we Network engineers get blamed for everything. Anytime there's a problem, it's the engineer, it's the network, it's the internet down. No, the internet's not, not down. But we actually had a problem where it was the database server and we weren't able to realize that it was a database server that was acting slow until we were able to see the traffic itself. And that was just by being able to see IP to IP traffic. So I really feel like it uncovers a lot of issues that, that um, are based on application or network engineers. Perfect. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is actually a pretty good question on software versioning. Um, and this uh, looks like, um, yeah, since there's a conglomeration of software solutions that make up the architecture, what control and coordination will there be when versions of one section or another are updated or changed and who resolves the finger pointing <laughs> or when a vulnerability is discovered um, someday down the road, how is the proper responsible party identified? Sounds like a kind of a conversation around managed versus unmanaged, um, et cetera. But um, what do you think on that, guys? Yeah, I'll, so I'll start out by saying, you know, that that's that goes back to the slide where I had managed, co-managed DIY. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to maintain that patching on your core SD-WAN infrastructure, then it's, it's your call. Um, you know, what Matthew said about co-management, hey, I see there's a new release out. I like some of the features in there or it addresses a security concern we have. I want you to patch it for us. And then on the flip side, is that, that fully managed? Um, I would still, as an engineer, make sure that they're doing it in a timely manner. Um, but yeah, it falls on their shoulders. I'll say this too. You can, you're, you can somewhat make the case for picking a, a, a multi-technology platform as well. So there are some that will have SD-WAN, some with SD-WAN and security, some with SD-WAN security and WAN optimization as well. So you can absolutely split those things out, but if you're really worried about absolutely having that one throat to choke, there are a couple of vendors that will put all that together into, into one platform. You know, and Matthew, one thing that we haven't even talked about is the fact that we're talking about SD-WAN vendors, but there are so many managed service providers out there that manage SD-WAN. So when you look at the, the 50 to 70 different companies that are doing SD-WAN, there's five times that amount of MSPs that can do that co-management for you. So picking that the right one there is just an, another 
hurdle that you have to jump, but they, those guys could be the ones that are responsible for maintaining your infrastructure as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, I think that's great. I uh, really, um, you know, these questions were awesome. I think we did a great job. Panelists, thank you so much for getting through them. Um, I can't thank you enough to C3, you know, to Joe, to Matthew, to Palo Alto, um, Pepe, you guys have been great, Patrick and Barrett. Um, clearly, we've, uh, I, and I also just want to thank our, our Beers with Engineers community. You know, we're on our 15th month of this and the numbers keep growing. We really appreciate the time that you guys take to you know, get out of the day today, um, hopefully in kind of everything we're going through right now as a country, this was something for you to get out of your day today and uh, see some uh, familiar faces potentially and just some smiling faces still excited about technology um, and to listen to a pretty cool topic. I, uh, you know, again, can't thank you um, enough and our Beers with Engineers community for attending today. Um, our next Q3, and we will hope and pray that that will be in person, um, is going to be around uh, ransomware and recovering from ransomware. U.S. Signal currently has a DRAZ offering going on right now um, that's allowing, you know, two months free for disaster recovery as a service. Security, um, cloud-based technologies, you know, we talked a lot about uh, cloud and SD-WAN today, the future of the WAN. Um, there's all kinds of things, right? The future of the data center. Where are people hosting their applications? Where are they going? Um, how how uh, how strong is the core network that's supporting those those applications that you might have hosted in a third-party data center like a U.S. Signal? And we are really excited to continue on sort of that whole security and real really business continuity topic for Q3. Um, I put the you know the URL here for our Dres promo. We'll for sure send out um, you know a thank you and registration for next quarter. Um, and really just hope and pray that everyone stays healthy and safe during these next few months. And we will definitely be in touch. And like I'd mentioned, hopefully in person next time. Um, but again, thank you so much to our sponsors, uh, Zerto, C3, um, Palo Alto. Um, can't thank you guys enough. And really, really great questions, guys. Uh, we'll definitely be in touch with some follow-up emails. And we're off. Thanks, guys. Man, yeah, bye, Barrett. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank yeah, you. thank you. See you guys yep. later. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yep. Bye bye.